Mark chapter 1. This evening we get to finish the first chapter in Mark's gospel. Our text that we'll consider will be verses 29 through 45. Follow along with me, reading from the Gospel of Mark. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they took him about, they told him about her. And he came, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, They brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew about, they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went through all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. And said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer your your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it. And to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. This ends the reading of the Word of God. William Carey once said, I don't fear failure, I fear succeeding at things that don't really matter. I think that is a profound statement. Don't fear failure, but fear succeeding in this life at the things that don't matter. I think a question from the very outset as we get into this message that I want you to think about. What are you living for? What are you investing your energy, your resources, and your passion in? The question that we might ask of this text What are the things in this life that really matter? Well, we could answer that easily and say, well, the things that Jesus cared about. What is it that we can see from this the last section here in Mark chapter one concerning the things that Jesus cared about? What did Jesus care about while he was here on earth? And the first thing I would submit to you that we see from This text in verses 29 through 34 is that Jesus cared about people. Jesus cared about people. Mark quickly moves into this movement of Jesus here. We can see in verse 29, Jesus is moving from the synagogue that he was in this morning most likely as he is teaching and healing in the synagogue. And he moves from the synagogue to Simon's house. This is still the Sabbath day. This is a very long day for Jesus, as we would see here. This, the previous scene, verses 21 through 28, probably took place in the morning. Maybe after morning breakfast, they went off to teach in the, sa- in the, in the synagogue, as was the custom on the Sabbath. Maybe a little bit later on into the morning, after the teaching time in the, in the synagogue, comes this encounter with the demon-possessed man. That Jesus then heals him. And Jesus would then go to spend his afternoon and evening here at Peter's house or Simon's house. It would be a long afternoon. It would be a long evening 
for Jesus. And we notice here that there's a problem that he runs into. We see that as Jesus goes to Simon's house, Simon's mother-in-law has a fever. Here's the problem. They're thinking, we just witnessed we just witnessed Jesus cast out this demon. Surely a fever is no thing for Jesus. Let us immediately bring him before Simon's mother-in-law. There's a few observations here about this text. Peter's married. Peter is married. Peter is a family man. He has a wife, no doubt. You can't have a mother-in-law without a wife. So Peter is married with his mother-in-law living with him, but it's Peter and Andrew's house. So Peter also has Andrew in the house as well, his brother. Peter is no doubt a family man. This goes to show us the cost that Peter was willing to make in following Jesus and giving up everything to follow after Jesus. Nothing was to stand before being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Family did not come before following Jesus. Jesus. And so Peter brings Jesus to his mother-in-law who is lying sick with a fever. Notice Jesus' action that we would see here as he encounters this sick woman. Verse 30, now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever and immediately they told him about her. They weren't going to waste any time. And notice Jesus' reaction he came, he took her by the hand, and he lifted her up. Matthew and Luke would record this same event from just a little bit of a different detail. Obviously, we can see what they're trying to emphasize. Matthew emphasizes the touch of Jesus for the sick. Luke's a doctor. He's concerned about the posture of Jesus. So when he tells this event, Jesus is standing over her as a doctor would have in the first century and rebukes the fever. The point that we would see here, even from this passage, is that when Jesus healed her, he healed her completely. Notice the outcome. He took her by the hand and lifted her up in verse 31. And the fever left her. And she began to serve them or minister to them. Have you ever had a cold before? Everybody in the last two years has gotten sick, right? You see, when Jesus took her sickness away, she wasn't on the mend. Not many of us go from having a sickness or a cold to then all of a sudden being completely 100% healthy. We're, in, we're recovering. We're getting over the hump. It's been the worst of the days, but I'm starting to feel better. I'm getting my energy back. It might take a week. It might take a week and a half. It's very interesting. She is down and out with a fever, and Jesus lifts her up, and she is 100% back to normal. We see that because she began to minister to them. She began to serve them. She had her full energy back. No doubt she maybe have been laboring with her daughter now. Jewish custom on the Sabbath day was to eat three meals a day. Traditionally, they would only eat two, but on Sabbath, three days it could have been time to make the middle meal or the lunch meal for them. Again, the point that we would see here is that Jesus cares about people. Jesus cares about people. He cares about those who are sick. People matter to Jesus. This isn't some profound truth, but it is a helpful reminder to us. You see, as we grow as Christians, we don't necessarily get overwhelmed with all these new truths. We need to be reminded of the simple Timeless truth. Jesus cares about people. We would see that first in the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, but then the events of the day continue to escalate. And so moving past the healing of the mother-in-law, we have in verse 32 and 33 and 34, we see that word has spread. It didn't take long in Capernaum before word gets out that there's a miracle worker among us. There is somebody who cast out a demon. We knew the oppressed guy who was convulsing, and we saw this teaching with authority, and this miracle worker is among us. Word is, he's at Simon's house. And so Jesus begins to draw a crowd. 
They say, did you hear what happened in the synagogue this morning? And as faithful Jews that they are, they wait until the sundown when the Sabbath had ended and they make their way over to Simon's house. A great crowd, Mark would record for us. And I want us to notice here first of this, of verses 32 through 34. Notice first, Jesus, the great physician, notice his patience. And I'm not talking about his long suffering. I'm actually talking about the people that came to get healed, his patience. It was all, we would see here, all who were sick or oppressed by demons. They believed that the miracle worker can heal sick people and cast out demons. When I read this, I think Capernaum's a pretty messed up place. There's a lot of sick people in Capernaum. There's a lot of oppression in Capernaum. Jesus doesn't do anything by happenstance. Capernaum is a great place for the master to display his care and his sovereign authority. Capernaum would bear witness of the mighty works of Jesus. So the patients, they come to him, all who were sick and oppressed by demons, but not just that, he drew an audience. There were the sick and there were the oppressed, but we would see Mark's use of hyperbole, certainly, But to emphasize the dramatic nature of what is going on, the whole city was gathered together at the door. Now, you can't put the whole city in a door. But what he is saying here is that this is no little flash in the pan thing. This is not some isolated little event that was taking place. This is very important to Mark's Roman audience. As they are far removed in Italy, and they're hearing these stories through Peter, recorded by Mark, that this isn't some secret Actions that occurred in a vacuum that could only be attested by, by, by a few. No, all of Capernaum could testify that Jesus, at least the miracle worker, was among them. The audience, the whole town is there. And we see displayed the great physician's power. He healed many who came to him, he healed the many who came to him, and he silenced the demons. As we would see here at the end of verse 34, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. You'll notice through the beginning part of Mark's gospel that there is this secrecy motif that is going on, that Jesus is silencing the demons, that the first confession besides the heavenly voice is the demon who's confessing Jesus to be the Holy One of God. And now these demons know who he is, and Jesus silences them. You would see even after the cleansing of the leper, he tells them, don't go tell people. And we have to wonder, why is Jesus doing this? What is the reason for Jesus to want to conceal his fame and recognition at this time? Well, if we think about it, it's what he needed to do. It was absolutely necessary because if the secret is out that the Christ is among us, well, the crowds would be, as we already see at the end of chapter 1, overwhelming, forcing Jesus out of the city, out into desolate places. It would also accelerate his passion. He's got a job to do. He's got disciples to train. He's got an apostolic mission for these men and that they need to be with him to be trained so that Jesus needs to, in, in, in early on, to seek to hide or conceal his identity because he will get to the point later on, chapter 8, chapter 9, and he lets it all out. He says, I am. And he, and he, and he, and he affirms his identity, but not now. Not now. This is the beginning of the ministry. And even still, and Jesus is seeking to, to, to conceal the, the identity by silencing the demons, word cannot be stopped concerning, at least for their perspective, the miracle worker among them. This is an interesting passage that we would see here about Jesus healing the many, his care for the people. We see in Isaiah 53, 4, concerning the suffering servants, surely he has borne our griefs or our sickness and carried our suffering as he did for the many who gathered that night at Peter's house. But a fourth thing I would like for us to notice and observe from this passage too is the great physician's care. The great physician's care. Jesus cared for people. But not just any people. 
Notice who these people are. Notice the types of people that Jesus showed his loving care to. First, Jesus shows his concern for a woman. Simon's mother-in-law. Women were considered second class in the first century, especially in first century Judaism. Jesus not only shows care for the second class among them, but he also shows care for the outcast. All who were sick and oppressed, all who were considered unclean, all who were considered to need to be outside the camp. In early first century Jewish, most likely a prayer of the Pharisees was something like this, Lord, thank you that I am not a Gentile, a woman, or a tax collector. This was the attitude of apostate first century Judaism. And Jesus shows care for the least of these. Jesus' care for people are what would be considered of the day the second class and the the outcast. So when we ask the question, what are the things that really matter in this life? We can see from Jesus, people matter. All people matter. All people without distinction matter. Whether it be a woman, a sick person, an oppressed person, somebody suffering with mental illness, the drug addict, the criminal, the tax collector, the adulteress, even the religious. These people matter. Jesus gave his time, his energy, his resources, his divine power because he cared for people. Think about that day. Think about that day that Jesus had in Capernaum. Starts off early in the morning. Think of it as a typical Sunday. Starting off early in the morning, going and preaching and teaching and spending yourself. That takes a lot of energy. To come home and to heal and to deal and, and to, and to, and to uh, minister and outpour yourself there. To have a late night and all this city gathering there. What a tiring day. I love Sunday nights when I go home because it's been a tiring day and I'm exhausted and I just want my sushi and then go to bed. And I think to myself, I can't wait to sleep in tomorrow. I have all these expectations that I'm going to get this crazy good sleep. It never happens, but I still think I will. I can imagine after a long day like that, pouring himself out, just saying, God, I'm tired. Father, I'm tired today. Let me ask the question before we move to the next one, just by way of application. Do we care for people? The ones that are not like us, the ones that look different than us, maybe the ones that might believe something a little different than us, These aren't Christians coming to Jesus. These are people wanting something from him. These are people that want his works, not his words. They're fascinated by the miracle worker. What can you do for me? Do we care for people that look differently than us, that act differently than us? Do we spend our time with people that just look just like us? It is worth thinking about because this is what matters in life, caring for people. Next we'd see in verses 35 through 39 that Jesus cares about priorities. Jesus cares about priorities. Remember that long day that he just had? You'd think maybe the master would sleep in a little bit. No, Mark is very intentional in what he tells us in verse 35. And rising very early in the morning... Let's add a little more detail. It's not just early morning. While it's still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. This is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Here we see the priorities of the Son of God. Jesus makes time for prayer. 
This is his first priority. After a long, exhausting day of ministry, remember, Jesus in his humanity was dependent upon sleep, food, and all the things that were necessary. He was like us in every way without sin. On the human physical standpoint, yet he makes time for prayer. He had every reason to catch some extra sleep that night. I could only think of the excuses he never gave. Father, I spent my whole day pouring myself out for others. Noble, noble example. I was preaching and teaching in the morning. I was engaged in spiritual warfare right before lunch. I was taking away fevers in the afternoon. I was up way into the evening, healing and casting out demons and doing good to people who wanted my works but not my words. I poured myself out for the good of others. But I would submit to you, it is all of those reasons and for those reasons that Jesus rose early to pray, devoted himself to private prayer. Commenting on this, J.C. Ryle says, we ought to see in all this the immense importance of private devotion. If he who was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners, thus prayed continually, how much more ought we who are compassed with infirmity? If he found it needful to offer up supplications with strong crying and tears, how much more needful is it for us who in many things offend daily? Further down in this passage, Ryle would go on to conclude, To be prayerless is to be Christless, godless, and in the high road to destruction. A most convicting statement that cut me up this week as I thought on this. Have you ever said or thought, I don't really have time for that? I'm not talking about prayer. I'm just talking about anything. You've all said it. You've all thought it. I just don't have time for that. Well, that's not necessarily an accurate statement. Because you will always make time for what's important to you. And you don't, it is also true that you might not have time for something. But what you are actually saying is that's not a high priority in my life. Because there are other things of higher priority that take time. That are taking that time. I only have X amount of hours in the day to do what I need to do. So when we say we don't have time for that, we are saying that's not high on the priority list, whatever it might be. You will always make time for what is important for you. I don't care what it is. It's, so, it's true. Communion with God was first priority for Jesus. He makes time for prayer. He sacrificed sleep for prayer. And notice here, after he has gone out to a desolate place to pray, that he needed that alone time with with the Father. We see what Simon does. Oh, here's the first time the disciples do one of those open mouth, insert foot moments. I told you the most favorable that they got was when when Jesus saw him at the Sea of Galilee. Here they go, they missed the point. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him diligently with aggression would be the translation. They aggressively searched for him and they found him and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. This is so important what Jesus does here. There's a great lesson for us in Jesus's response to everyone is looking for you, Jesus. They say, Jesus Man, we, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, you, Jesus, you drew a crowd. Did you see what happened last night? Man, I've never had that many people near my house. I know it's early, Jesus. We've been looking for you since we woke up and noticed you weren't there. And so was actually everybody else. Everybody else is looking for you, Jesus. We need to pick up the, with the momentum from last night. There's more to heal. There's more ministry to do. Look at the great opportunities that we have before us. We've got something going here. 
they're missing the point. The disciples are missing the point. Because remember, as I said, the people wanted the works of Jesus, but not the words of Jesus. And Jesus knew this all too well. For we are told throughout all the gospel writers, the Jews seek signs. And this is the important point that I want us to see of Jesus' priorities here. Jesus would not allow the urgent to distract him from the important. Jesus would not allow the urgent to distract him from the important. Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus said to them, it's as though he didn't even hear them. Let us go. Let us go to the next towns. Peter comes with urgency. There is ministry. You are needed. People are looking for you. Here's an application. We have to sometimes be people that can say no. We must say no to the urgent and prioritize what is important. We can find in our lives always responding to the urgent or the emergencies at the expense of the important matters of our lives. You have those important things that you need to do, but you always find yourself giving in to the new pressing matter of your life. Sometimes this is our inability to say no to good things for better things. And remember this, brothers and sisters, everything that we say yes to, we have to say no to something else. Sure, there's more ministry for Jesus to do in Capernaum, but that is not his priority. His priority is not to be a miracle worker and draw a show. No, he makes it clear what his priority is here. So Jesus says no to further ministry in Capernaum, the urgent to say yes to the preaching in the next towns because that's what is important. As he would tell us, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also for that is why I came out. Why I came out of Nazareth, Jesus would say, but more importantly, why I came out of heaven to do this mission to devote myself to the preaching of the gospel. No, Jesus isn't ignoring the hurting. Jesus isn't giving up on people. No, Jesus cares about people. But it's not about the message, or it's about the message, not the miracles. It's about the words, not the works. And what we see here, this principle here, Jesus prioritizes the important over the urgent. statement like this might get me in a little bit of trouble, but I've been in trouble many times else in my life. There will always be ministry to do. Brothers and sisters, understand this. There will always be ministry to do at the church. There will always be urgent needs in the congregation, and they should be met. Yes, they should be met. But to neglect the important in your life and always giving in to the urgent in all circumstances is to fail in your roles and responsibilities that God has given you. Men, your marriage is important. Do not allow the urgent to distract from the important. Moms, dads, your children will never be the age that they are. That is important. And if you are neglecting the important, soon it will become a crisis. And that will become urgent. What does it profit me to gain the whole church but to forfeit my family? Do not sacrifice your marriage or your family life on the altar of ministry because there's always a pressing need. We must share the load. Do not neglect important ministry for urgent ministry. And I am not saying do not respond to emergencies. I am saying that we are, and there are times when emergencies call for immediate action. But do not live your life in the emergencies. Do not neglect your own personal disciplines of spiritual formation, for those are important in your life. 
because this next urgent thing comes your way. You might be awesome at fixing and settling urgent problems, but if you are neglecting important things in your life, you are also creating problems. Jesus could have allowed the urgent of Capernaum that Peter assumed was urgent to distract from the important, but Jesus stays on mission. And it is time to go. And that is the third priority we see of Jesus. He went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus cares about preaching the gospel. So what are the things that really matter according to Jesus? His priorities. We would see prayer, personal prayer to God, committing to doing the important over the urgent, and sharing the gospel. What are your priorities? What are our priorities? We must understand these are not specific to Jesus. Certainly this is his ministry here, but we are to share in these priorities. Prayer, personal prayer to God, communion with God. It all starts there. Sometimes the urgent takes away from personal prayer. So easy we can get distracted and shortchange our prayer lives. It's usually the first to go, is it not? Or our prayers become shorter and shorter. That personal time with God becomes more infrequent because I've got all these pressing matters in my life. Prayer to God is important. Communion with God is important. Sharing the gospel. For that is why Jesus came out. And so they did. And you notice, as he went out and shared the gospel, he preached in the synagogues and he cast out the demons. He continued to do good and to heal those people that he came across. So again, I ask, what are our priorities tonight? Do they align with Jesus? Do they align with Jesus' priorities. A third thing we would see here about the cares of Jesus in verses 40 through 45, that Jesus cares about purity. Jesus cares about people. Jesus cares about priorities. And Jesus cares about purity. We see here coming as Jesus has gone throughout Galilee, he has one more incident and it is with a leper. This wouldn't be his last incident, but it is of chapter 1. And Jesus comes across a leper that comes to him. This is a person with an uncurable skin disease. Uh, Leprosy was a term for various kinds of skin diseases that would uh, range across the, the spectrum, taken from Leviticus chapter 13. It can mean boils on the skin that erupt. It can come from burns that can get infected, erupt, and exposing raw flesh. It could be this reddish-white rash or white spots on the body that turn the hairs white. The skin could pop open and ooze. It is a very unpleasant sight. Thinking about leprosy makes me kind of feel gross. I would not want to see what leprosy actually looked like in the first century. Whatever the form of leprosy that this man coming to him has, we are not told, but we need to know in this case there is no cure. There is no cure. If we were to liken maybe this disease to something in our modern day or in our recent past, maybe the AIDS virus would be a comparison that we could talk about, a disease without a cure that can be transferred upon contact God in the Old Testament commanded that those with leprosy had to be placed outside the camp of Israel in order to protect the nation from widespread infection. In the time of Jesus, the lepers would live in isolation. They had set up leper communities where all these people with these skin disease, so they wouldn't infect each other anymore, could come and this quarantine leper community was set up. It was a terrible existence. It was a sad way of life. Not to be ministered to, 
to be outside the camp, outside the covenant community, not to be touched. You could come to the point where your skin would become numb and that you could not even feel touch. You would lose the senses and the nerves would, 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 would go out. And so, again, a very pitiful and sad predicament that this person is in. And it is interesting, we would notice here in verse 40 that the leper came to him. The leper left the quarantine community. The leper had heard of this man and desired to come to him. Matthew records this same account after the Sermon on the Mount. Luke as well, but for our sake, we're considering what Mark has to say. This is an unclean man with a physical, with a phys, with his physical um, appearance is vile. It is a reminder of sinfulness. Leprosy is likened to the human condition of sin. And notice here the posture of the leper. He came to him, imploring him, and kneeling. This is a sign of true humility, that he comes to Christ, knows his condition, knows that he is unclean, knows that he is unworthy. He is a vile wretch. He is quite aware of what he is like. And so he kneels before Christ, and he gives this great proposal. If you will, you can make me clean. It's not a question. It's a statement that he makes here. He's trusting in the ability of Jesus to do exactly what Jesus can do. Matthew adds in his account that he first addresses him as Lord. A recognition of the sovereignty of Jesus. But what we see this leper doing is he is casting himself before the mercy of Almighty God. And Jesus responds in such a beautiful way. Moved with pity. Other translations, compassion. Some renderings say indignant. What we do see here, I don't think the indignant is, is an accurate translation, but this pity, compassion of Jesus, Jesus desires this man's purity. Jesus desires to do good to this man. So moved with pity, filled with compassion, Jesus stretches out his hand, and it says he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. Did you catch what happened there? The most profound thing in that statement is that Jesus touched him. Imagine the people that were standing around at this moment, the disciples there. Yes, he's healed a sick woman. Yes, he's cast out the demons. But here comes the uncurable skin disease, visible for all to see. You know if you touch a leper, you are unclean. You are not allowed by, by the law to touch this person. You cannot come into contact. You are ceremonially unclean at this point. And Jesus reaches out and touches what is unclean. The gasp at that moment. Jesus, do you know what you're about to do? Jesus, you can't touch him. Because when you touch him, Jesus, you're going to be unclean. Moved with pity, he reached out and he touched him. When was the last time this leper was touched by anybody? And immediately, the leprosy is gone. The boils disappear just as Peter's mother-in-law rises up. There's no period of recovery. Right before their very eyes, this man is made clean. When Jesus touches what is unclean, it is made clean. The leper is cleansed completely. The dermatologist would be going nuts right now. They would be bewildered. There's no explanation for this. How do I diagnose this? What has happened to you? 
This is physically impossible. That's what a miracle is. Jesus touches what is unclean and makes it clean. And again, we would see here as he heals him completely, Jesus sternly charged him. Again, this secrecy motif going on here. Don't, don't, don't go, but see, go to, say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest. Jesus tells him to comply with Leviticus chapter 14 concerning the cleansing of leprosy. Even here, we're reminded that Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We must understand here that Jesus cares about purity. Jesus cares about this man's condition. We also must understand, as I had just said, when Jesus touches something, he makes it clean. He does not become unclean. And leprosy should serve as a reminder to us of the universal human condition of sinfulness. Jesus cares about complete purity, not just cleaning up the outside. Sin is the condition of the soul that we all have that has left all people outside of the camp, outside of the presence of God, outside of the tent of meeting. Sin has alienated us from a holy God. And as the leper was to come to the priest... He would have been met outside the camp because he was not permitted entrance. Leviticus 14.3 And the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall look upon the leper. And before he could gain access into the camp because of his leprosy and a place among the people of God, we would read in Leviticus 14 these words. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, and one ewe of a lamb, a year old without blemish, and a grain offering of three tenths, fine flour mixed with oil, and one log of oil. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed, and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall shall take one of the male lambs and offer it for a guilt offering along with the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Here it is. And he shall kill the lamb in the place where they kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the place of the sanctuary. This is what it would take for a leper to be reintroduced into the community of God's people. One who is outside of the camp, who is unclean, ceremonially unclean. The lamb had to die. All this, so one who was once unclean could be among the cleansed of the people of God. And we understand this, Leviticus 14, to be temporary. It was temporary until the one spotless Lamb of God would come. So let me ask, how can Jesus touch what is unclean and make it clean? Because of what we would read in Hebrews 13, 12. Because Jesus suffered as the unclean one outside the camp. Hebrews 13, 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. Jesus can touch what is unclean and make them clean because when he hung upon the cross, he bore their uncleanness. No, Jesus never became unclean, but he died for all uncleanliness, all ungodliness, paying the price for all who will believe upon him. Friends, we can enter into the camp because Jesus suffered outside the camp. We are cleansed because he took upon us, upon him, our filth, paid the debt that we owed We read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Jesus cares about purity so much so that he would die. Jesus suffered for your sins. Jesus suffered for your sexual immorality so that you would no longer be a slave to it. Jesus suffered for your gossip. Jesus suffered for your hard-heartedness. Jesus suffered for your apathetic spirit. Jesus suffered and died for your selfishness. Jesus gave himself up for our unworthiness so that we may no longer live for ourselves. But the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Jesus cares about your personal purity and my personal purity. So friends, as we bring this to a close, let us live for what matters. People, priorities, and purity. Jesus shows us what matters by caring for people, by showing us his priorities and his commitment to purity at all cost. So do not fear failure. Fear going through this life not caring for people, for the weak and the marginalized. Fear going through this life with the wrong priorities, allowing the urgent demands to distract from the important. Fear living this life without a commitment to purity, fear succeeding at the things that don't matter. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Christ, what he has demonstrated for us. And as disciples of your son, we seek to walk in the way that Christ has. Help us, Lord, forgive us of our failures. Forgive us of our concern and self-centeredness. Forgive us for wanting to serve out of convenience. Forgive us for not prioritizing the things that matter. Lord, help us to live a life of purity. Let us look to Christ who gave himself up, renewing us a love and an awe for our Savior that would motivate us out of a heart of gratitude and thankfulness to live a life pleasing unto you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.